Good morning. My name is Al Houghton and welcome to The Word at Work. We are conducting a school learning to walk with the Holy Spirit in the last days, and we are finding out some very interesting things about our relationship with the Lord and our position before him in sonship. Now, this is really the essence of Ephesians. Well, actually, the whole book of Ephesians developmentally is about sonship, <clears throat> primarily starting in chapter one. And so we have been looking at sonship <clears throat> all the way through here, and one of the interesting things the Lord has said to us, which I never heard before, was, okay, Jesus prayed this and initialized it in prayer in John 17, <clears throat> but my answer to the initial prayer of Jesus concerning sonship is in 2 Corinthians um, really, five and six, <clears throat> and five sets a stage for it, and six has the pattern of its unfolding. Now, that's what we've been looking at, and the interesting part of this, because in literally, what what we have to do is is go back to John seventeen and. If we look at it in 20, 21, 22, 23, Jesus very clearly is asking God that you and I would experience the same relationship he had with the Father. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their words, 17, 20, 21, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, I in you that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. All right, our ability to walk in our sonship is the key to revealing the Father in the earth in the last days. Because here's how Jesus put it, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So as we come in to maturity as a son and daughter of the Most High, then God is free to fully express himself in the earth. And all of a sudden, we have the Psalm 2, Psalm 110. We, we have the end time harvest of nations on and ultimately the grafting in of the Jewish people. So all of a sudden, I mean, the... Book of Revelation is a full-blown operation. It's starting out, but this is essential in the church. So what we're saying, you know, very clearly, we God is calling us to grow into the fullness of relationship with him by the Holy Spirit. I, it's just that simple. And he expresses what he is going, the Father expresses exactly what he's going to do in answer to what Jesus prayed to make that a reality for you and I. God's going to do that with us. And all we have to do is say, okay, Lord, I, I'm in, or ask for it. How about that? Lord, bring me into fullness of relationship. All right, verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, have given, past tense, that they may be one just as we are one. What proves God is real through the church in the last days? What does it look like? The glory of the Lord. It looks like the glory of the Lord in the book. Now, it doesn't just look like what the glory of the Lord is preached in your church. It looks like what the glory of the Lord looks like in the book. Is that a problem? <laughs> Well, it could be. It could be a problem if we look at the glory that visited the Jewish people, Israel, when Moses was leading. Because the glory, oh man, the glory came to dispose of some people. I mean, you, you had to be careful about the glory in those days. Because if you found yourself in opposition to what God was doing, and so you're bucking the leadership, you're bucking the move of the Holy Spirit, you're just saying, no, 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 we're not going to do that. 
Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. I mean, how many examples do you need? These things are, are written for our admonition on whom the ends of the world have come. Not everybody agrees with the Holy Spirit when he reveals what he's going to do. There's always a faction or two that, nah, that's not God. <laughs> well, will the glory come and settle who's God and who isn't? Apparently. I mean, uh, uh, if I read the prayer right, then we need to wait. What does this look like when it comes? And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. All right, you, you remember that time we talked about, it, I think, last week. <laughs> so I'm sure you remember it. All right, Jesus is in his own hometown. Well, they didn't like what he had to preach out of Isaiah 62 because it, it didn't quite fit their narrative of who the Messiah was, and they certainly weren't willing to accept him as the Messiah. So they were they had to stone him according to the law. So they took him out, led him out to brow the hill, and we made reference to the fact that this just appeared a number of my, what, six months ago or so, in the um, the series, The Chosen, that they are doing about the life of Jesus. And I think it's in season, they were just airing season three. I believe it was in episode three or four. And there was Jesus in his own hometown, and they took him out to the brow of the hill. That people knew him, his own hometown. He grew up there. So, I mean, the rabbi knew him, and the people, and the leaders of the synagogue. And I mean, you know, we knew this kid he grew, he grew up here. This is Jesus. I mean, he had a bunch of friends there. And uh, I mean, so they were grieved at the fact that they were going to have to throw him off the hill. And uh, Jesus looks back and, and then this is typical. Here's what the glory looks like when you're not expecting it, okay? Not today, boys. And he walks right through them. They were, uh, the glory came and they were unable to proceed with what they were planning to do. The glory stopped them in their tracks. Are we going to see the glory that stops people in their tracks? Well, apparently, if it's the same glory that God gave Jesus, yes. Was that the only time they tried to kill him? No. They tried again, and all of a sudden, they couldn't find him. And the Bible says he hid himself and walked through their midst and went his way. The glory. Will the glory hide you? Yes. Will the glory stop people from trying to kill you? Yes. The glory, what does the glory look like? Well, we think of the glory, well, that's when God comes to heal. And that's when God comes to bless. Or how about it when God comes to save? I mean, you, you can't just take the part of the glory you like or hear preached on Sunday. You got to take the whole glory, cover to cover, the glory. And you tell me, cover to cover the glory? You mean the glory in the book of Revelation? The glory? The glory that disposes of people in the book of Revelation, the glory that sends out those horses, the glory that brings plagues, the glory that brings disaster, the glory. We better handle the glory with a kid gloves. We better develop the fear of God when it comes to the issue of the glory. How much fear of God we got in the church right now concerning the glory of the Lord? Well, there's plenty in this Bible. It didn't take long. As soon as Korah, Dathan, and Abiram went down alive into the pit, the fear of God was in the congregation. Hello. How long did that last? Till the next day. How many thousand people started... Uh, don't him. Let's get rid of Moses. The next day, the numbers. You just can't believe this stuff. I mean, you know, you try to put yourself. One of the things they taught me back in seminaries, you know, if you're trying to understand the Bible, put put yourself. Try to put yourself in the historical setting, and you know, just kind of be a, a person that's looking around. Kind of try to think the way those people think. Try to experience, you know, what's going on. Try. Put yourself in the scripture and, and try to imagine yourself. Well, 
I, I have tried to put myself in the season of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram and, and tried to imagine, okay, how that all went forward. And for the life of me, I cannot explain how only 24 hours goes by and you are right back. Now you talk about the glory. Oh my gosh. Well, I'll tell you what, I probably shouldn't even have brought that up. Oh, well, anyway, I did. But it's true. Church, come on. This is the glory of the Lord that is not just restoring people's health. It's ending rebellion. It's the glory that comes to dispose if necessary. And it looks to me like in the season of the book of Revelation, it is necessary. And that's sad. That's sad for all of us. And how in the world do you go represent God when it's necessary to do Ananias and Sapphira? You, most of us will say, man, I don't want any part of that. Do we have a choice? You tell me. If you're going to walk with the Holy Spirit in the last days, are you going to let God be God? Or are you going to say, no, I'm sorry, Lord. I can't represent you today. I can't go there. Not me. In good conscience, I have to look at what this says and then look at the panorama and present it to you. Otherwise, your blood is on my hands because I have diminished the word of God and I will not do that. No way. The glory is coming and it's coming full blown. And you and I are going to wind up pleading with people in order to save their life because they don't see the glory like we do. And therefore, they're in jeopardy and don't know it. And if they won't hear you, they're probably walking in to the end of their life because they're going to meet the God of glory and the glory will terminate. I mean, all through the Old Testament did, all through the book of Revelation, it does. Come on, church, the glory heals. Oh, thank God. Yeah. Does it give new arms and legs? It will. It's creative. Okay. Hey, well, I, I would love that. Who wouldn't? But we're talking about not just part of the glory that we like. We're talking about the whole glory of God in manifestation. The glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be. See, what's the issue here? The issue is that they may be one. If I don't accept the whole glory, I can't represent all of who God is at any given moment because I am say I'm closing the door to part of what is just uncomfortable. I don't like it. I don't want to go there. In other words, I will not use my faith on my flesh and give God what he wants. Don't do that church. You cannot do that in the last days. Over and over again, this book warns, God warned the prophets, God warned Jeremiah, do not diminish the word. Don't diminish the word. Do not diminish the word. What I give you, and see what the, Jesus made that commitment. I, whatever the Father speaks, that's what I speak. Whatever I see the Father do, that's what I, I will not diminish the word. And that's the same commitment God demands from you and I. So, Father, in Jesus' name, all of us in the Word at Work family who are studying with you, we lift our hands to you right now and we say, we commit to participate fully. We will not diminish your word. We will not diminish your glory. In Jesus' name, we will represent you to the best of our ability in the full measure of what you want to do when you want to do it. In Jesus' name. I in them, you in me, that they, oh my. I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect. Tell E-O-O -O 
in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. How's God going to know? Uh, how's the world going to know that God loves you and I just as much as he did Jesus by the demonstrations of the spirit that come out of your life as you represent the Lord? That's the church in the last days, the full-blown glory. And when you go to Isaiah 35, you find out that that glory is a highway. It's a highway in the spirit that you travel on. Well, I mentioned it, so I guess I'm obligated to go back there and, and look at it. It's, it looks to me like it connects with the Philadelphia church. All right, it's one of the blessings of the Philadelphia church. It looks like it, but here's what it says, okay? A highway shall be there and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness, Isaiah 35, 8. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast be on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there and the ransom shall return and come to Zion with singing everlasting joy on their heads. Hallelujah. What is it talking about here? It's talking about the glory of the Lord being there. The glory is the atmosphere on the highway of holiness. The lame shall leap like a deer, the tongue of the dumb sing. Waters shall burst forth in the wilderness, streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool. Strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees. Well, listen to verse two. Well, I, I just might as well do verse one. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly, rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Now, the glory of the Lord is the atmosphere on this highway. And it is given as a place of safety, apparently, for people to tra traverse and to do the will of God, probably to bring in the end time harvest of nations and set up the Jewish people coming in. I mean, it, it sort of looks like what it's there for, but that's the purpose of the glory. Well, how's the glory presented in Isaiah 60? Arise, shine, your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, darkness shall cover the earth, deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise on you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you. His glory will be seen upon you. Next verse. The Gentiles shall come to your light, kings to the brightness of your rising. There's your harvest of nations, the glory. The glory is coming. Psalm 2, operational, in action, starting to unfold. Psalm 110, in action, starting to unfold in front of us. God is answering the prayer of Jesus in John 17, and he does it. And this is the part, but boy, I... Never understood until God said it. Look, I answered that prayer in Scripture. Scripture records my answer to the prayer of Jesus. High priestly prayer. Second Corinthians. Okay, Second Corinthians 5. Now, here's uh, in chapter 5, verse 11, gives you kind of a um, preview of the fruit of what's coming after God visits his people in six and deepens this relationship in five steps. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. See, that's coming with the glory. The terror of the Lord's coming with the glory of the Lord. And that's what you and I need to understand and be prepared for. God, we're, we're going to stand in the terror of the Lord. We're going to stand in the fire. Our God is a consuming fire. We're going to stand in the fire. When you stand in the fire, you can call the fire down. You can announce the fire. You can plead with God to stop the fire. I mean, when you walk in the fire, you have all these options. 
Moses. They're God's options. You and I are just okay. What are we? Are we saving them or are we removing them? What? Speak, Lord. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, does that sound like Paul spent some time pleading with people? But we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. Woo. Hello. All right. Now, when you get to six, see, that's a preview. All right. Paul's saying, look, I know this realm because God took me here. Actually, he showed up and knocked me to my knees into the dust. And when I got up, I was blind. Yeah, I'd hope to shout. Did he learn the terror of the Lord? Yeah, he sure did. Oh, my. The hard way. Woo, Saul of Tarsus. Yeah, he got a little glory. How'd that work for you? Blind before you're healed, okay? Hey, why Why are you um, destroying my church? Woo, wow. Yeah, I guess so. He got the glory. Church, coming again. You hear this? It's coming again. These five things. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We started in verse 14 last week. And we got through the first three of these. Now, in verses 14 through 16a, what we have here is God revealing the uh, sneaky, underhanded, uh, deceptive plans of the enemy to gain access unseen through deception. Deceptive plans to gain um, a place in your life through darkness and the shadows, okay? And so the Lord, uh, actually what we have here is an, a sort of continuation of exposure from Isaiah 14. Now, Isaiah 14 is the very first place that we see uh, what happens to Satan. The worship leader of heaven sins and becomes Satan is kicked out of heaven. Verse 12, how you're fallen from heaven on this first sun in the morning, how you're cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. Now, what's interesting about this, there are five I wills here. And when we go uh, then past the... Um, the five things we're looking at now, the five deceptive uh, issues of Satan trying to gain access to church people, to your life. Then we come into five I wills of God that absolutely destroy these five I wills of Satan forever. I mean, God says, I will, I, I will. You're going to be my son and daughter. Hallelujah. And which is what we want to look at today. But here, here we have the five I wills of Satan, that sort of the preamble to the five I wills of God uh, alerts us to and says, open your eyes and look at this. And if there's anything here, you know, just turn away from it and let me have my full access and I will to your life. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation all right, on the further sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Okay, the entire kingdom of Satan is self-exaltation. It works through personal defilement, and it works in the dark. All right, it works through deception. All right, so what we have then, five, count them. We have five, starting in 2 Corinthians six fourteen. We have five deceptive uh, attempts of the enemy to gain access, okay? And we looked at the first three. Number one was in verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship, all right? Met oak A was the Greek word. And we noticed that this fellowship is really sneaky because the enemy is... is uh, in, 
And you learn that because when you look at what Met Oak A means, it means to share by personal participation, to share by putting your presence in a place with uh, fellowship as righteousness with lawlessness, with people who reject the word. Okay. They openly reject the word and you are going to show up in some of their events and, or some of the things. You, you are going to lend your presence to what they buy. Uh, you're going to lend approval by presence to um, their rebellion, their lawlessness. And God says, be careful of that. They're trying to gain access. They're trying to gain approval from your presence. And be careful about granting approval because it can be viewed as uh, your presence going to things where you don't belong because if you don't approve of it really pray before you go or be a part of it Woo, wow met okay i mean that's to look it up i mean i boy god said to me go to the greek you will not understand these until you look at it in the greek and that is exactly what happened okay so Number one, um, what fellowship met okay? Okay, has righteousness for lawlessness? Answer, it doesn't. What communion? Okay, there's number two. And what is that word? Koinonia? koinonia? We know that word. What koinonia? Koinonia. And when you look at the word koinonia, what do you find? Social participation by presence, <laughs> by being there. Social participation, social participation because you're at the meeting. You're you're with the group. You're going somewhere. Koinonia can develop. Okay, and uh, who boy. But what does the second thing say ab about uh, this one? So number one, what fellowship is righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion, koinonia, has light with darkness? Answer again, doesn't. They don't fit together. All right, koinonia. So uh, met okay, koinonia. And what is number three? Well, number three and going from uh, verse 14 to 15, and what accord has Christ with Belial? The Greek word for accord there is sumphonesis. Now, sumphoneo is our word to agree by saying the same thing. Sumphonesis is agreement by uh, presence. It's, it's agreement by uh, being there, it's so so the it's the potential uh, approval that comes from your presence. So what you see developing here, what starts with fellowship, then then grows with communion, then grows with symphonesis, but it's not coming necessarily because you uh, mentally agree with something. It it is happening because you've chosen to be present. And to some people, it looks like your lend your presence is lending your approval, and da 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 da, and down the list it goes. Although in your mind, you may not. You may say, no, no, no. And so then the issue comes. Okay, you know, watch this path, because this is a path to the enemy gaining access into your life through participation, and that's the warning. And it's the the. Uh, the preemptive warning of, look, I am coming to give you my fullness, so you need to guard against this and be careful of it. All right, so what is number four? So there's uh, number three, all right? And, um, hallelujah. What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part number four, and part is meris, and meris is the Greek word that uh, 
means part or portion in personal fellowship. To occupy a, a part or portion in personal fellowship. All right. And that it then is number four. What part has a believer with an unbeliever or what share? And again, same answer. And number five, what uh, agreement? Oh, my. And that's in verse 16. Has the temple of God with idols. And so when you look up this, and it's an unusual word for agreement. I, I didn't. I thought, wow, how did that escape me all these years? Soon cat at uh, om a i e. Wow, that's a long one. What does that mean? To deposit one's vote or opinion in company with. So there, you kind of got your your graduation of lending your presence to something, because you end up casting the vote of your presence in company with. Wow. I mean, that's that's dangerous. Yes, it is. And, and that's why scripture warns us, because Satan is a deceiver. And so through deception, he's trying to gain access. He's trying to bring us into agreement with idolatry. And when most of us say, well, you know what? We're not going there. All right, well. Make sure you don't. Be careful. Pray about the places you go, the places you lend your presence to. Pray whether you belong there or whether you're not. Well, is it is it dangerous? It could be. All right, it could be. Certainly according to this scripture, it most certainly is. Now, notice the transition in verse 16. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God as God has said. Okay, here comes God. I will, I will, I will five times. Here comes the Father saying, this is what I'm going to do for you relationally in the last days. This is my um, actualization of the uh, pouring out answer to the prayer that Jesus prayed. I'm going to do this in my sons and daughters. Woo, again, it just explodes when you go to the Greek and look at it. Oh, my gosh. All right. Second Corinthians 6, 16. I will dwell in oiko. In oiko. What does that mean? That means to take up residence with one purpose, to influence thought, word, deed. I am going to take up my friend. There you go back to John 14. I go to prepare a place for you. Place, tapas, an encounter where the Holy Spirit's going to manifest the will of God. Monet, a dwelling place for the Trinity, a mansion. You're it. You're the temple of the living God. And that's how he introduces this. For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. Man, go to John 14 and just read that whole chapter, John 14, 15, 16. Woo, there it is. Exactly what Jesus is explaining is coming to them. Guys, you think your ministry's over if I leave. The truth is just the opposite. Your ministry starts. How about this in relationship? Your ministry catapults into a whole different level when you say yes to sonship. And I think that's why in Matthew 11, you got, I mean, a stunning statement of all those born and women, of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist when it comes to prophets. But he who is least in the kingdom, son and daughter, is greater you kidding me? Greater than John the Baptist? Well, Jesus said it. It's in red. As a son, and he, he's referring to family. He's talking about your relationship. John the Baptist is the last one that prophetically ministers out of the old covenant. 
And from then, uh, Jesus is the pattern son. All of a sudden, now we minister out of sonship. We are the temple. Jesus has prayed the whole world will know there is a God because of what he does through us. They will see it. They will demonstrate it. They will experience who God is through us as sons and daughters. And here, in answer to the prayer of Jesus in John 17, the Father says, I will dwell. I take up my residence. Exactly what Jesus said in John 14. If I go away, we will come and make our Monet, our home, our mansion with you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. For what purpose? For the express purpose of N O K O. Give you the thoughts of the Father, give you the words of the Father, give you the deeds of the Father. Thought, word, and deed. I'm coming to influence you in thought, word, and deed. Boom. There's the whole package. You can walk like Jesus. You're going to think like Jesus. You're going to talk like Jesus. You're going to express God in the last days. Nothing's off the table for you. Nothing, church. Come on. I'll tell you what. This changes how you think. Uh, number one, it changes how you think. You, you transition out of a sinner saved by grace into a son and daughter of the living God with a covenant of sure mercy. I mean, you start thinking like King David, acting like King David, because you got the revelation of King David, and that we already know what that produced. That produced mighty men. You couldn't kill them. Woo! That produced an army. Hello. Army of God. You tell me, is Joel chapter two say God's raising up an army in the last day? Uh huh. Does Acts chapter 15 say, I will restore the tabernacle of David? Yes. Yes. I will rebuild it as in days of old for what purpose that they may possess all of the Gentiles who are called by my name, the harvest of nations? Yes that the prayer of Jesus might be fulfilled. God is rebuilding the tabernacle. King, the attitude of King David has to come on the inside of you. You got to think like it, act like it, talk like it, walk like it. David didn't go to war until they found out how to do it. He was a Holy Spirit guy. He built the tabernacle so people could go fellowship with God and find out what to do when. God said, I'm rebuilding that. That relationship King David had with me, I'm going to rebuild that in you. Philadelphia churches, it's happening. You better find one. Hallelujah. <laughs> We're doing our best to be a Philadelphia ministry. <laughs> uh, but you need a church where you can go, where you can go rub shoulders with men and women who think like, act like, walk like, talk like, will not diminish the word. Hallelujah. Amen. God's got them all over this nation. I will dwell in them, in oiko. Lord, we say yes. You said I will dwell, now come dwell in fullness right now in our lives, in Jesus' name, to influence how we think, how we speak, and how we act in the name of the Lord, because we want your fullness. You said it, we believe it, and we are declaring it. The fullness of God dwells right here on the inside of me in Jesus' name by his spirit. Amen. I believe and accept. I will dwell in them. Oh, baby, here comes number two. I will walk among them. Oh, man, I don't even know what to say about this word. I will walk among them. We've mentioned it. We've talked about it. But I had to look it up. And I, when I looked it up, I went, are you kidding me? Imperipatao, a double intensive. Woo. Well, there's a there's a another double. When when uh, in Greek, what you do if you want to strengthen the word, you add uh, uh, prefixes to the beginning of the root word. <laughs> Imperipatao. Oh my gosh! Wow. I, yeah, yeah. How many of these? Oh, brother, this maxes out. I mean, it's 
it, it would take a paragraph to explain this. Now, basically what it refers to, and I mean, this is the important, you know, this, the, the, the only way to give you an idea of the fullness that is in this word, we got, got to go back to Joshua. I, um, I was praying about this. God, how, how, how in the world can I help people understand what, what this means in, in the uh, transformation in our thinking that's necessary to really walk like this, to let you do what you say you're going to do right here. And I felt like the Lord said, uh, take them back to Joshua and read Joshua chapter one. Okay, so there's several things that happen in the book of Joshua that gives us a picture of the New Testament, especially out of Romans eight. I mean, boy, they're solid. Romans eight is solid in what transpires in Joshua. Joshua is an example of what Romans eight speaks of. All right, here it is. I would now listen to this. All right comes right out of the transition. After the death of Moses, as Joshua 1.1, 1, 1, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise. Go over the Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. M peri pot a o i every place you walk every place you put your foot you are taking my dominion you are taking the anointing to conquer you are taking the anointing to uh transform an area covenant of sure mercy you can reverse the curse where there are thorns and briars man they'll come up myrtle trees and it'll be fertile place you can transform it you can lift the curse off anywhere, any place. You can bring salvation. Hallelujah. Every place the sole of your foot will tread. And anything rises up against you, I will grind it to powder. Woo. Man. See, you, I mean, if you really read this and say, God, are you really going to do this through me? You're going to do this through me. I will, number two, yes. Jesus has been made to sit at the right hand of God until his enemies are made his footstool. Footstool. Somebody has to walk on the enemy in the last days as a demonstration. Tag church, you're it. I will. God said, I will. This is I will, number two. I will, number one, to influence how you think, how you talk, how you act. I will, number two, get ready. Here comes my authority. You're going to possess territory for me. You're going to take salvation to blighted areas. I mean, you're going to turn it around. Ooh, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea, Toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Let me ask you a simple question we've talked about many, many times. Did Moses ask God, take us as your inheritance, make us your people, make us your sons and daughters? Yes. Did God give Moses a covenant? Yes. Where is it? It's in Exodus 34.10. I will carath a bare eighth. I will cut a covenant with you. I will do. Now, they've already come out of Egypt. I will do wonders, signs beyond what was done in Egypt. I will eclipse all of the confrontations of Egypt. I give you a blood covenant, Moses. This is what it's going to take to bring my sons and daughters in in the last days. And I give you a covenant to do it. Ooh, imperi pi a o. Ooh, -hoo. here comes God. Man, you ready for this? Here comes God. Okay, next verse, verse six, chapter one. Joshua, be strong and of good courage, for this people you shall divide as an inherit inheritance. In Did you get an inheritance in Ephesians chapter one? Yeah, sonship gift number eight. Inheritance. 
Is it sealed by the Holy Spirit? Sonship gift number nine. The same God who was there when you were created now seals you for the inheritance that you're going to get by the anointing in the last days. Oh, man, are you kidding me? It's a no-lose deal, guys. God's coming. God's coming. The I will, the I am, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is coming to display Jesus through us. Hallelujah. Because we are sons and daughters, and we are going to demonstrate who the Father is in the earth. Hallelujah. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all that's written in the law. Do the word, do the word, do the word, obey the word, obey the word, obey the spirit, obey the spirit, obey the spirit, obey the spirit. If you obey the spirit, you will walk out the will of God and the demonstrations will follow as needed. This book of the law, verse eight, shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that's written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Be a doer of the word and be a follower of the Holy Spirit. There it is, bottom line. That's your preparation. And here come the five I wills of God. Ooh, I'm going to walk through you, man. I'm going to walk. It's going to be your words, but it's going to be my steps. You're carrying me. I'm going to walk with you. Have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Then Joshua commanded the officers and people saying, pass through the camp, command the people saying, prepare provisions for yourselves. For within three days, we will go over this Jordan to possess the land. Now, is there a problem with the Jordan at harvest time? Yeah, it's full bank, it's flooded. It's flooded. So what does God command them to do? <laughs> Are you kidding me? You know what he commanded them to do. Go priest, go put your foot in the Jordan. Now that's over in chapter three. Joshua uh, says in chapter three, verse five, said, sanctify yourselves tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders among you. Joshua spoke to the priest saying, take the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and they went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to magnify you in the sight of all Israel. You should command the priests to bear the Ark, saying, when you come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. By faith, step into the water, boys, with the Ark. And when you step into the water, all of a sudden, it will stop and it will heap up to your left and you will go across on dry ground. Now, what do you discover in Joshua chapter three that is alluded to in Romans chapter eight? What you discover in Joshua chapter three is that the creation, the creation understands that it has to aid the servants of God in harvest and in their purpose in the last days. The creation works for God who created it, and it will help you out. It will help you out. And so when God says, cross over and possess the land, okay, boys, take the ark into the water. And they walked in the water with the ark, and all of a sudden, whoo, the water started to, well, yeah, you can read it. It's in Joshua chapter 3. I'm not going to take time. You know the story. Oh, by the way, are we going to attack Jericho? Well, you're going to walk around, and you're going to shout seven days. You're just going to walk around it, and you're going to shout for victory. You're going to throw a spear? No. Nope. Not going to need to. What? Shoot an arrow? No, not going to need to. Walk around it seven times. Shout, shout, shout. And on day seven, walk around it seven times. And then shout. And watch the walls like an elevator go straight down. They did chariot races on top of those walls. That's how thick they were. They're going straight down in, like an elevator. They're going down into the earth. And then the whole place is yours. 
and it was on the creation. What do you learn? You know, do you remember you go over to chapter 10 in Joshua? I mean, you know, we might as well make this point. I, I know we're only in number two. I will walk among you. But do you remember what uh, happened over here in uh, Joshua chapter 10? I bet if I read verse 12, you'll know exactly what happened. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in sight of all Israel, Son, stand still over Gibeon, moon in the valley of Agilent. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people executed covenant vengeance on their enemy until they had completely won the battle. The creation was tasked with aiding the people of God in their purpose in the earth. And so it is in the last days. And all of creation is groaning and travailing for the full-blown manifestation of the sons and daughters of God to stand up and say, here we are. You will no longer fund evil. You will fund the harvest of nations in the last days. Church, do you understand? Literally, there has never been a season like we're walking into. It is 100% relational. God has, has had it in his heart for thousands of years to demonstrate who he is in love, convince people. He's God and there is no other. Idols can't stand. Woo. Paul prophesied it in 2 Timothy 3. You're going to face them in the last days. But just like it was with Jan S. and Jan Bress, they will bow their knee. Hallelujah. At the power of God that comes through you. I will number two. Where you walk, I walk. Where you walk, I walk and you carry my authority and my dominion every place you go. It's dominion over demons. It's dominion over Antichrist resistance. You carry the dominion. Now walk in the spirit and release it. Hallelujah. Walk in the spirit and release it. It's full blown. The dominion of God. You see it right here. You see it in the prophets. And it's alluded to in Romans. What, what is the most often quoted verse in the New Testament from the Old? It just happens to be a psalm. And it's in Psalm 110. And actually, it's the first verse. It was written by King David. You, you can imagine as God rebuilds the tabernacle of David, rebuilds the same relationship, King David had with God in us, in his church people in the last days, then this is going to be the fruit of it. Psalm 110, verse 1, the most often quoted verse from the Old Testament in the whole New Testament. This is it. And it comes by relationship. Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Well, how's he going to do that? Next verse, the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Zion's where the temple was. Where's the temple today? We are Zion. The temple, Zion, is in us. God is in us, in Zion. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. All these things are written for our admonition, training upon whom the ends of the world have come. You go back and look at Joshua. Look at what Joshua had to walk out. That's what your end times looks like. That's what the glory of the Lord manifestation on the church looks like in the end times. Only we are not subjugating people. We are saving them for participation in God's kingdom. We're going after a spiritual harvest. Hallelujah of nations. And God says, I'm going to demonstrate through you. And our job, show up and walk in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Walk in the Holy Spirit. I mean, 
God has already answered, hallelujah, the prayer of Jesus. And he says, I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. Can we say yes to that? Father, we receive number two. I will walk among you. I will walk through you. I will conquer through you. I will overcome. I will resurrect. I will bless. I will reverse the curse in Jesus' name. So, Lord, by your spirit, now walk through us in Jesus' name in the last days. Let us see the fullness of what you're about to do in Jesus' name. Lord, we bless you for it. We thank you for it. And we say, do it. Do it with an outstretched arm and do it with a mighty hand in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Well, what can we say? Look, we, we've got three more of these, but you know, each one of them deserves their full time in scripture and they're worth, I mean, this is who God is in us in the last days. I will dwell in you to change how you think, how you speak, and how you act. I will walk among you. I will demonstrate. I will grind resistance to powder in front of you. Ooh, M. Perry Pot A. O. Man, what a word. What a word. God did it with Joshua. He's getting ready to do it again. He's going to do it again in the last days with the church. It's coming. People are going to know who the Father is. They will be able to discern the difference between God and I. Pardon me. Because God's going to demonstrate it. Hallelujah. He's going to do it because he loves people and he wants to save them. Church, a greatest season in the history of the church is about to unfold in front of us. And it's our job to prepare a generation. Our sons and daughters, our grandkids, we have to prepare them. So it looks like, you know what, we have to hang around long enough to do that, or at least our part of it, in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. What an awesome season we are in. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he shine his face upon you. May his glory be seen upon you in Jesus' name. And may it manifest through you everywhere you go demonstrate his glory, demonstrate his goodness, bless people in the name of the Lord, heal, deliver, and set them free as only you can by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You get a chance, go to wordatwork.org. Hallelujah. And if you get a chance, sow some seed. It's going to come up in authority. It's going to come up in harvest, and you'll like the harvest in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. All right. Are we going to finish this? Whatever it takes. Next week, same time, same place. See you here. <laughs>